The Maserati seems elegant compared with the squat Mercedes. It was in the 50s every schoolboy's idea of a racing car. Powered by a classic six-cylinder double overhead camshaft engine of two and a half litres with individual water feeds to cool each exhaust valve. The Maserati was not fuel injected and therefore was less powerful than the Mercedes. John Watson test drives a 250F. I have a lot of respect for this particular car. I would think it's a kind of car that probably was best suited to the, the classic photograph of Fangio driving at Rouen, 1957, coming down a sequence of very, very quick left and right-hand corners. Epitomizes what the 250F is all about. <laughs> Judging it by the standards of the day, it was probably very competitive, but I think the car is ideally suited to the very fast open corners of faster tracks. But it was neither quite the definitive front engine car, but it was probably slightly in advance of its contemporaries. The 250Fs were successful but never managed to beat the Mercedes. Why? I think that they suffered from being Italian. If Maserati brothers happened to be born in Stuttgart, no doubt this car would not be red, it would be silver, and it would have been winning Grand Prix. I think the difference that we're seeing in the program between you know, the, the Maserati here and Mercedes and other cars of that period is the, the difference in the attitude of and the, sort of the mentality of the, the countries. In Germany, they took a design which, in many respects, was a very pre-war design, but they incorporated certain innovations, certainly with the fuel injection, and they made it work, they made it powerful, and they made it reliable. What but they, they maybe didn't have quite that sort of engineering flair that Italian engineers do seem to have. 32 250Fs were built, most of which were available for sale to independent drivers. Sterling Moss had acquired one for a specific purpose. My father and my manager, Ken Gregory, had gone to see Neubauer at the end of 53 when they heard the new Mercedes were coming out. And Neubauer said to them, look, we think Sterling has great talent, so we've seen him do very well in a, in a pretty mediocre car. We'd like to know how well he'd go in a decent car. We suggest you get buy a car like a Mazza, which we did. And I happened to get fastest lap in the Swiss Grand Prix at Bern in front of the Mercedes team. And I think that was what clinched my arrangement. Neubauer asked me to go and try the W196 at Hockenheim, and uh, I had most impressive. I mean, I went there, and this is in the middle of nowhere, and I drove the thing. I came in with a black face. You may remember they had inboard brakes, and you've got the dust. I had a black face, and I got a bit of rag, and I'm going like this, and the mechanic came up, and he clicked his heels, and there he got a bowl of hot water with soap in his hand and a towel. And I thought, this is in the middle of nowhere. This guy had got hot water. I thought, this is really impressive. Monaco, 1955 was Sterling's first European race as a member of the Mercedes team, a point the newsreel missed. Sterling Moss was there, of course. Here's Maurice Trantignon of France and veteran driver Taruffi of Italy. Now Louis Chiron and finally Kling of Germany. Prince Renier was a spectator during the race itself, the 13th European Grand Prix with 20 competitors taking part. Mercedes had built special short wheelbase cars for the sinuous Monaco circuit. The circuit at fantastic speeds. This course is about the most treacherous in the world with its narrow streets and hairpin bends. Number two, Fangio, held the lead in a Mercedes for the early part of the race, but he was later overtaken by Sterling Moss, number six, driving another Mercedes. Unfortunately, it wasn't Sterling's day. He had to retire later with a fractured oil pipe. In this sensational Grand Prix, having averaged 65.8 miles an hour in a Ferrari, Trantignon won a cup worthy of his performance. Win or lose, the Mercedes team was run with military precision by Alfred Neubauer. An ex-driver, he had been the company's racing manager since 1934, and as Sterling Moss soon discovered, was held in high regard by the whole team. There was an enormous amount of respect, the respect of Neubauer as the team manager, I mean a fantastic character and a man who thought very much of his drivers and would keep people away to try and make things easy for them. He'd always get us the quiet rooms if he could and he knew the personalities and the, and the habits of the drivers and he would 
set things up that way. I mean, in other words, Fangio didn't like to get up very early. Kling was German, he didn't mind. So Kling would be called out for an early morning test, and then it would be, next would be Hans Hermann, maybe, and then myself, and then Fangio. And little things like that. It was a very human team. Uhlenhout used to drive the cars, didn't he? Uhlenhout, of course, was English, uh, English mother, and a terrific driver. I mean, a great engineer, but there was a man, if you came in and said, listen, this doesn't handle too well, he'd get out there and prove that it did. And if it didn't, he would, he would have the knowledge to be able to, to sort it out. Three Mercedes were entered for the 1955 Belgian Grand Prix, but only a lone Lancia D50, an exciting car which was in many ways in advance of the Mercedes, with pannier fuel tanks and offset V8 engine of 260 horsepower. Vittorio Giano was the designer. His was the lightest Formula One car yet built. Other cars were being rebuilt to the delight of small boys. It was common practice for teams to hire local garages to prepare the cars and then drive them to the circuit. Maseratis and Ferraris formed the main opposition to the Mercedes. Number 12 is Kling's car, Fangio and Moss being the other drivers. The 1955 Grand Prix at Spa was to be the last race before motor racing was to be changed forever. Before package tours cheapened European travel, the old money enjoyed the cosmopolitan atmosphere of the Grand Prix circuits that was virtually unchanged from pre-war days. The drivers, too, were old friends who competed mainly for the enjoyment of the sport. Amateur or professional, there was, in 1955, still little distinction between gentlemen and players. Some of us raced for fun, and I consider we were amateurs even though we were paid, whereas you've got professionals who race for the profession as their business. Amateur or professional, they faced 316 miles on one of the fastest circuits in Europe. Fangio leads, but Castellotti's Lancia has out-accelerated Moss, whose relaxed style was pioneered by the veteran Italian driver Farina. I saw Farina racing, I think it was probably in Bari, and I remember his straight arm, and I thought, boy, that man does look, he looks so cool and relaxed. I thought, half the thing, when you're racing neck and neck with other men, is if they think you're really relaxed and cool, they don't know how hard you're trying. And I thought, well, that does make sense, because if they think I'm gritting on and, and I'm right on the edge, then it's not too difficult to think, well, I'll try and pass the man. So I sort of worked on that and honed that thing out till hopefully my competitors all thought that, you know, my head back a bit. My head was back a bit, I think, actually, because then I could peer over things. Moss may have appeared relaxed, but the Mercedes needed careful handling. I'm surprised, really, the Merc wasn't a little bit easier to drive, because it wasn't. Oh, it was a driver's car, but not an easy car to drive. 